I'm delighted uh, to stand here to uh, have the opportunity to share uh, some uh, thoughts on the subject of wind energy. This is going to be a very brief tutorial, as it were. It's not going to get uh, in any technical depth uh, in any of the aspects that I will talk about. I understand that uh, there is an audience here with very diverse backgrounds, and so hopefully uh, I will uh, say things that will make sense to you. But if you have questions about anything particular and so on, uh, please come talk to me later on, and we'll be happy to engage with you. All right, so I uh, sit in these two departments, aeronautics and astronautics and mechanical engineering, uh, and the topic of wind uh, sort of fits nicely across uh, these departments. Uh, wind energy is about extracting energy from the wind, uh, and that involves both mechanical and aerodynamic aspects to the problem. All right, okay, let's move on. So what I will try to do today is have some very basic uh, sort of concepts associated with wind energy. Uh, that's how we will start. And then I will jump into some current issues and opportunities. Uh, that's going to be the focus. And hopefully, if you're interested in some of these, so you will find uh, people who are working on these topics and so on and engage with them. And so for that, I will try to give you a glimpse of uh, some wind energy research at Stanford. I'll talk more about work that I'm involved in, but I'll also try to uh, provide uh, glimpses of work going on in other labs and uh, a look towards the future. All right. Okay, uh, well, wind is a renewable uh, energy source. Uh, it's driven by the power of the sun. Uh, sun shines uh, on the land, on the ocean, and so on, uh, heats up air, and so on, and there are slopes, uh, terrain, and so on. Uh, sort of different processes set up wind in the atmosphere. Uh, and wind is being driven, the energy for the wind is coming from the sun. And that's sort of a basic thing we have to keep in mind. And it's a clean source of energy. Uh, we don't need to use uh, any fossil fuels or water or uh, and so on. In terms of environmental impact, uh, the operation of uh, wind uh, power plants has very little uh, environmental impact uh, in a direct fashion. Uh, wind energy uh, resources are distributed uh, around the world, uh, and if we focus on uh, the United States, uh, here the map at the bottom uh, is indicating where the current, this is a map from 2015, where the various wind farms are, uh, and uh, the color coding is based on the capacity, the total capacity in the state. State of Texas has the largest uh, developed wind power. California comes next, Iowa, and others in other colors you can see. Uh, so you can see uh, that it's uh, spread out across the United States. Uh, and in terms of cost, the economics, uh, costs have come down over the decades and so on. And now, uh, depending on exactly how you do the calculation and uh, those who are in business and economics majors and so on can do this better than I can. Uh, so it, it, of course, matters as to what the policies are in terms of subsidies, in terms of assistance and so on. But uh, so the numbers might come out a little different depending on how you do them, but uh, it's, one can argue that the cost is now comparable to a cost of uh, other traditional energy sources, which is really dramatic. Uh, this is not where things were 20 years ago. Install capacity uh, today, uh, well, it's 2015 data, uh, is uh, uh, 73,000 megawatts. This is significant, and we'll understand these numbers more as we progress. Another key thing to keep in mind is that wind uh, is intermittent. It's not blowing at some fixed velocity all the time. It's not. And so uh, if you're going to use, uh, make significant use of wind energy uh, in the overall uh, energy uh, uh, that we are going to provide to people, uh, then uh, we have to cap, we have to factor this in because uh, we need to be able to take peak loads, but also balance them out and so on. And so this becomes challenging as the uh, wind, uh, the fraction of energy that is produced by wind becomes significant. And of course, uh, where the high winds are uh, might not be where the highest demand for it might be. And so you need efficient transmission of energy from where it's being generated to where it's going to be consumed as something which is true of uh, 
many sources. OK. Uh, let's uh, discuss uh, some very basic operation. So there are two types of uh, wind turbines. Uh, depending on the orientation of the axis around which uh, the blades of the turbine rotate. So if the axis is vertical, as is indicated here, then it's called vertical axis wind turbine. And if the axis is horizontal, and these blades, only uh, part of the blades you can see in this picture, uh, and uh, note uh, the scale of a uh, human uh, standing there on top of uh, this tower, uh, these blades are gigantic. If you look at the size of these blades, uh, they are larger uh, the tip to tip uh, distance uh, from one tip to the other tip. That diameter is bigger than the largest airplane, A380, which is the largest airplane. You may have flown in A380 or in uh, 747. Uh, these uh, machines are huge now, and they produce a large amount of power. Uh, seven megawatts uh, is a, a machine from Siemens. Uh, they range from a few kilowatts that you can install uh, in your uh, backyard if you have uh, some open space uh, to uh, large capacity uh, machines. So of course, the crucial thing is uh, the scale uh, uh, and how, how efficient is uh, that installation. Uh, uh, for an isolated wind turbine, efficiency is very straightforward to define. Uh, you can take the ratio of the energy that the machine is extracting from the wind to uh, that, is that which is available. Uh, and for conventional wind turbines, there is a well-known uh, way to think about this, and it comes up with a limit, uh, which is called the Betts limit. It's sort of like 57% uh, or something. Why can't it be more is something that we can easily appreciate uh, by imagining what is happening. Uh, the wind that is going to be intercepted by these blades, that is going to influence these blades, uh, that wind which is coming in has to also leave. We cannot just capture all of the wind, all of the power associated with, with the wind. Uh, if we were to do that, if we were to capture that airflow, uh, that amount of air somehow we'd have to store uh, and will have to grow uh, in, in the region where it's going, and we just can't sustain that. So wind has to come in and has to leave. Because it has to leave, it has to carry a certain amount of energy with it. And therefore, there is a maximum, there is a maximum efficiency of a wind turbine, which uh, can be predicted and for an isolated turbine. Uh, and an interesting question is, uh, how should one think about this when one doesn't have an isolated turbine? When you have a large-scale wind farm, you have turbines uh, here and there spread over uh, tens of kilometers of distance. How should one think about the turbine of the collect efficiency of the collective farm rather than efficiency of an individual device? That's still an open question. and. Uh, is one that we actively work on. Each turbine has a power curve uh, here in the schematic. A power produced by the turbine as a function of the wind speed. There is a cut-in wind speed uh, below which it's in, not economical to operate uh, the device. So it's stationary, it's not rotating. And then it starts producing power. Power rises rapidly as the wind speed rises, essentially like cube of the wind speed. And then uh, beyond a certain wind speed, uh, the power is regulated to uh, the maximum power. And this is for uh, purposes of uh, both aerodynamic efficiency and for safety. You don't want uh, the speed of the blades, the speed at which they are rotating, to keep increasing, and the loads on the blades to keep on increasing. Uh, those loads are going to go up as the uh, speed of the wind is going up. And so since mechanical loads have to be uh, well, within the structure limits of uh, the device, uh, one uh, cuts off the operation at some rated power. And so although wind can increase, the power is then uh, not increasing. And this is essentially uh, the situation which is called stall control, where the, the orientation of the blade is changed so that the amount of power that it produces remains constant. Uh, all right? OK, let's continue on. So uh, 
at, at present, around the world, one finds many installations. I hope that the image is uh, coming across here. Uh, it's not just one uh, row of turbines, but there's another row of turbines, there's a third row of turbines, there's a fourth row of turbines. And on this particular day, uh, nature cooperated in terms of producing clouds that sort of gave rise to these uh, regions of condensation of water vapor. And so we can, in this uh, image, we can see the wake or the region of the wind which has been affected by this turbine. Uh, that region is flowing into another turbine. And so if we say just qualitatively, if we think about how much energy the wind has, and if we extract some of that energy by a turbine, then downstream of that turbine, there will be less wind. There will be a smaller wind velocity. There will be less energy in the wake. And if that wake is to impinge on another turbine, then this uh, turbine is not going to see as much wind, and therefore the amount of power it can produce is going to be significantly less. So if you have a situation where the wake of one row of turbines hits another row of turbines head on, then you have a very significant loss in the power that the collection can produce. All right? So this is uh, what is called a wake loss. And this wake loss can be substantial at the farm scale. It can be as much as 30 to 40 percent. And so imagine that uh, your one dollar uh, is now only going to buy you uh, 60 cents worth of uh, power and so on. So it's a very significant number. Uh, and of course, it depends on many factors. Uh, it depends on the spacing. It depends on the wind orientation and so on. And so this was not very well understood when some uh, devices like this one farms, this Hornsrev farm uh, off the coast of uh, Denmark uh, was built. Uh, the story is actually that it was designed uh, with wind turbines of a smaller size. And by the time uh, the regulation, I mean, the uh, process for permitting uh, went through and they started building, at that time the turbine technology had improved. Uh, larger turbines became available and they were more efficient. So they thought, why not? deploy these larger turbines. They are more efficient. Let's put them everywhere. Well, <laughs> uh, their calculations, which were for smaller turbines, probably would have been fine for the spacing that they have, uh, but not for uh, these larger. So there is a very significant uh, power loss that is occurring. You can also imagine that in the wake, uh, the wind that hits uh, this turbine is more gusty is not uh, as uniform as it might be uh, for the first row of turbines. And therefore, uh, fatigue and maintenance costs associated with failure of components of the turbine also become more severe in a farm situation. And of course, this is a picture of an offshore uh, wind farm. Uh, there can be significant waves and wave loads on uh, the structure supporting uh, these turbines also become a critical uh, topic. All right? Of course, one can contrast large-scale wind farms to distributed winds, wind farm. Uh, this, this term is used by Department of Energy to describe isolated wind installations in remote areas and so on, where there is no other uh, source of uh, energy and so on. Maybe solar uh, and distributed wind can uh, nicely combine uh, for uh, remote locations. OK, all right, let's move on. Uh, so current issues and opportunities are reducing the cost of wind is a critical uh, uh, topic. And there are many ways in which uh, this can be achieved. Uh, and we can talk about this uh, later on. Uh, developing new uh, energy resources. And in this, uh, offshore wind is being uh, very strongly emphasized. Uh, integrating horizontal axis turbines and vertical axis turbines is something we are uh, pursuing. Uh, we're also pursuing strategies for reducing wake losses and for reducing fatigue. And of course, improving turbine aerodynamics is a topic that is uh, always of interest. Uh, there are some other uh, issues that I would like to bring your attention to. Uh, addressing the intermittency of the wind that I stressed is a critical issue. And of course, uh, sort of the uh, big issue with respect to uh, the energy infrastructure itself is an important issue uh, that uh, has to be addressed as well. 
All right? Okay, so let's now switch gears and talk a little bit about uh, different uh, research uh, threads that are being pursued in different uh, groups. Uh, Professor Alonso, Crow, and myself, we all three are in aeronautics department. I'm also in mechanical engineering, as is John DeBiri, uh, and we are interested in wind turbine aerodynamics, uh, different uh, problems being looked at. Uh, performance prediction and optimization for a wind farm is uh, uh, a topic of interest to at least these individuals, perhaps more. Uh, Full-scale uh, field testing of turbines is something that John DeBiri does, uh, and distributed uh, energy systems is also a topic of interest to him, and of course there are others who are interested in wind energy policies. So it's not a very fair uh, uh, way of describing everybody's research, but we need to move on since uh, we are, are going to be out of time very soon. Uh, so we develop computational models that uh, can do a flow around a particular wind turbine or an assembly of wind turbines, uh, and we can develop models that can then describe the performance of a farm, uh, and we can use that for optimization. And John does field, full-scale field testing, and also is interested in uh, these uh, distributed energy systems. So a big challenge that we face is that wind is highly variable. Wind uh, has variations of the order of days. Uh, you have uh, weekly variations, seasonal variations. Uh, you have daily variations. Uh, as the sun rises, uh, in many places it's calm, and then it becomes turbulent as convection starts and so on. Uh, and of course, there are variations that are associated with turbulence in the wind. Uh, and so there is a, a plethora of time scales. And so of course, the issue is we have to model uh, this appropriately. We can't capture everything. Uh, and so there is a, many different methods that are available. There is a high fidelity simulation method where you try to capture all the details and so on. And uh, as uh, I summarize here at the bottom, this is very expensive. So if you were to imagine uh, doing this for a thousand turbine array, uh, you're going to be sitting for quite some time on a high performance uh, computer system. Uh, this will take about two million uh, CPU hours. Uh, all right, it's, it's, it's something that we do do for research problems and so on these days. So I want to give you a sense that high performance computing has come a long way. This is not something that you would just dismiss. Uh, when you can justify the cost, uh, one does do, in fact, simulations of this kind. Uh, but it's not something you can use routinely for uh, purposes of design. One can also do low fidelity simulations where different models are put together and so on. Uh, and these are now uh, relatively inexpensive. You can run uh, this in a matter of few hours on a desktop. You don't need a high performance computer system, uh, but there are deficiencies. There are a certain important physics that are not captured. For example, dynamic loads associated with wakes impinging on another turbine are not captured by uh, such a model. And so what we have been doing in our group is developing models which allow us to do both uh, at relatively low cost. Uh, and so we call this uh, multi-scale kinematic simulations. This is work that my graduate student, Aditya Ghate, has developed. We have some papers, and we can talk about details later on. I just have some words describing it. I'm going to move on. We take lots of uh, pain and care to make sure that these models are validated, that they produce realistic results, and so on. Uh, and uh, details, uh, if they are of interest to you, come talk to me later on. Uh, and so we are uh, now uh, applying it to large-scale wind farms. And so to give you a sense of this, uh, this is motivated by uh, this big uh, firewheel wind energy complex, uh, which is, uh, when it's fully uh, built, it's going to be the largest uh, wind complex in the world. Uh, and this is being done in collaboration with uh, MAP Realty uh, And so this is what we are able to do today. Uh, this uh, prediction I'm showing you is for about 200 turbines. They are located in here. We synthesize the turbulent wind that is going in. Uh, this, uh, the colors are showing the wind speed. Uh, downstream of the turbine, you see the blues where the wind has slowed down. Uh, this is for a north-south uh, flow. Uh, this is for east-west flow. Uh, 
And you can see that the structure of the wakes and the manner in which they interact is very different. And so the power loss uh, for north-south orientation is 13%, whereas it is uh, large, 40% uh, uh, for east-west orientation. So the idea is that with tools like this, we can look at uh, the sighting. How do we place these uh, so that uh, the overall output is optimized not for one particular orientation, but for the distribution of wind and wind orientations that one expects for a particular location and so on. So these tools are going to be very helpful in future. Uh, so this is my last slide. If you uh, look uh, at the Department of Energy uh, website, you will find this uh, uh, very uh, fancy, glossy uh, report. Uh, DOE is very good at uh, uh, conducting very comprehensive studies of particular problems and then uh, sticking out uh, their position. So in 2015, they published this report called Wind Vision. Uh, and the vision they have is that in 2020, 10% uh, of electricity uh, could be uh, generated by wind. And this fraction increasing to, uh, this is the goal of 35% in 2050. Uh, the amount of land area this might need is very small. It's 0.04%. It's uh, tiny just to make sure that we don't get uh, concerned about that. Uh, uh, this growth in blue here is uh, that targeted for offshore wind, and that's sort of a, a big new technology push uh, that Department of Energy is envisioning. Uh, these are maps where the offshore wind energy resource has been mapped, and uh, if we compare it to uh, what the installed capacity is, uh, and you can plot that, data is available over years, over the last many decades, and you can see a, a rapid growth. This is from 2010. In three years, uh, there is a 20 gigawatt increase. Uh, and so uh, one can look uh, to uh, new uh, s deployments at large scale of wind, and the problems uh, that uh, uh, offshore wind at large scale introduces are um, multi-dimensional and so on. There's the problem of structures, building these large structures, supporting them uh, in uh, water under uh, the loads associated with waves and currents that may be present. Uh, and of course, uh, installing uh, the turbine itself, uh, and then uh, questions of uh, power that will need to be uh, drawn uh, from uh, these installations back to where uh, the high demand for them is so uh, cabling that is going to carry uh, the or the transmission line that is going to carry this power uh, back to where it's used, and then of course other issues of uh, fatigue and maintenance and so on. Uh, never mind those; they are also important. They have to be factored in and so on. But lots of exciting opportunities, not only from technology side, but also from the side of policy and from the side of economics and uh, where uh, we. Uh, as uh, overall community uh, move forward. Of course, it's a nice way of addressing uh, challenges associated with sustainability, uh, reducing our greenhouse gas impacts and so on. Those are something that very naturally and in a clean way happen. So without further ado, let me close and take some questions. Well, so uh, John uh, is very uh, keenly interested in vertical axis wind turbines. Uh, and the vertical axis wind turbines, well, actually, I think if I go to the next slide here. Yeah, this is uh, a picture of uh, turbines that he's interested in. Uh, and of course, this is the simplest configuration that you can have. And it's easy to install and easy to inspect and so on. Uh, one can have more complex aerodynamic uh, shapes in here uh, and uh, get more power out and so on. Uh, I think this is an area which is less developed. Uh, there are fewer 
uh, designs that are uh, being used of vertical axis wind turbines, so it's a, a naturally rich area for further exploration. Uh, I should say that overall efficiency-wise, uh, these guys are more efficient than these guys, but these guys can be small, they can sit uh, close to the ground, and so there's no reason why we can't combine these uh, with an installation of the horizontal axis turbines, and that's an area of collaboration between my group and uh, John DeBerry's group. Uh, well, so it's, it's, it's a question that uh, you have to ask, what is the penetration? How much uh, wind resource are you uh, deploying? How much of it is being modified by the turbines that you're operating? And if that is significant, then in the local region, there may be other effects because obviously you are modifying the atmospheric boundary layer. And so the manner in which it may be transporting uh, say, moisture, or it may be dispersing other things in the atmosphere is, is affected. And so these are topics that are of interest and are being studied and so on. Now, whether the impact is negative or positive depends on the quantity and also depends on how everything is oriented, what the details of each situation is. And so it's a topic of interest to uh, many faculty here. So I, I can't say that there is a very simple uh, short answer to that. One last question. Yeah. Uh, which companies or are there any companies currently offering that type of modeling commercially? The, the complex modeling you're talking about for large scale wind farms? Uh, so I would say uh, all uh, large wind turbine companies are interested in uh, tools and models of this kind. Uh, they have in house uh, capacity to do uh, sort of the RANS level. I mean, I don't know whether technically uh, I can speak about the details. Uh, but the kinds of models that we are developing, uh, we're trying to uh, collaborate with the companies, uh, create these relationships and so on, and make these tools available to them and so on, because the uh, more they're used, the better uh, it would be. So thank you for that question. Okay. <laughs>